lucky then hi again the few of you who are here um, right I'm gonna continue with experiment and I'm gonna talk about experiment design uh, doing it with experiment uh, yes so let's start right away so this is what we had already from uh, Tuesday um, this is just the uh, control structure we have from experiment or design experiment or design so um, first we initialize it design not experiment we get some experiment here from experiment and then we have to control start con control initialize control start and control end okay um, so now let's look at experiment design and well how does experiment design generally look like well generally we have some experiments so we go to something and there's an experiment and then there's some stimulus which is shown in well, in, a different, in different versions, for example, you have different numbers and uh, number sequences, you have different images, you have different stuff you need to look at. Um, so some stimulus is shown or different stimuli are shown in a random order, sometimes mixed with distractors. Yeah, so each display of a stimulus we call a trial, and then normally experiments are split up into multiple blocks, offering like different version of the stimuli, and like in between the blocks there's a pause, where um, the subject can decide when they want to continue, and so on, so on. So, what is the general order? There is an experiment, well, da. Um, this is what's returned by this ex um, experiment.design.experiment, uh, which would be a capital E, because it's a class. No, that wasn't capital E. Um, in this experiment, we have one or more blocks. Each block consists of trials, and then in each trial, you have one or more stimuli because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So to show how that would look like, that didn't work. So let's run it in PyCharm. That looks better. So this is. Uh, the Simon task, for example, I'm going to explain what it does later. So I have to press left if um, the stimuli is green. So that's red. I have to press white, white, left, white, left, left, left. So that was our first block, and now the instructions are different. I have to press left for red. So I'm going to press white. Right, left, right, left, right, left. So, left. The, so the theory um, behind the Simon task is that if the stimulus is on the same side than the button you have to press, um, you're faster to press the button, even though the actual position of the stimulus and the button have nothing to do with each other. Um, I'm going to get to that. Actually, you can just look at it here. difference in QC reaction time in trials in which stimulus and response are on the same side and trials in which they are on opposite sides. So if stimulus and response are on the same side, you're faster to respond. Interestingly, even uh, if the stimulus has nothing to do with the actual response. Um, but this uh, had nothing to do um, with what we're currently working with. So just to show you, we had two blocks in here. Uh, one where you had to press um, left for green and one where you had to press right for green. So this is what it normally looks like. And then we had a multitude of trials, and the stimulus was either on the left or on the right, and there was exactly one stimulus, namely this, um, this red or green square. Okay, so let's look at experiments design package, which is made for exactly this. So the design package has the classes described in the sculpture, so we have the experiment, the blocks of the experiment, which are so each experiment has blocks, or the blocks have trials, and the trials then have the stimuli. Um, nicely enough, it also allows for between subject factors, su such that uh, if you want to test, so if you want to give one um, group of subjects another set of, uh, of um, um, another set of uh, stimuli than another set of um, of uh, persons, then you can have this between subject factors, such that experiment automatically decides. Like if you have, for example, two variables which can either be one or two, and you want to give 
each subject another combination of that that leads to two times two equals four different factors. So there are four different versions. An experiment automatically makes that depending on the sub subject ID. So if the subject ID is uh, divisible by four, then they're gonna get version one. If the subject ID plus one is divisible by four, they're gonna get version two, et cetera, et cetera. So this between subject factors is automatically done. That's really nice. So we don't have to look for this. We just have to pay attention that the subject IDs um, are actually equally split. So first person gets number one and then two and then three and so on. Yes, and then experiment can just simply export this to be used by other packages. So if you want to use PsychoPy, but uh, you want to make your design with experiment that's easily possible, you can just export it to a CSV or something, and um, you made your experiment with experiment, and then you can use something else to show it, or you want to show it on mobile phones or on the internet, just make a CSV using experiment, and then you can export it. Yes, so normally we specify the design of an experiment before calling this control.start such that once we start, because also when we hit control, when we reach the point of control.start, the uh, subject is supposed to enter their subject ID, and at that point we already want to know, for example, the between subject factors, right? So we have to do this before calling control.start such that in the experiment itself we can simply loop over all blocks, and in all blocks we loop over all trials, loading all the stimuli in this trial, and then we're already done. So this is what it would look like. Um, we have this design.experiment. We had this already before, otherwise it doesn't work. Then we initialize, and then we make the design of our experiment. So we have a block. It's simply experiment.design.block. Experiment it has a name, and then uh, we make a trial, and we make a stimuli, stimulus. And then we simply add the stimulus to the trial, we add the trial to the block, and we add the block to the experiment. Now our experiment contains one block with one trial with one stimulus. And then control.start, and in between control.start and control.end, so where the actual experiment is, what we simply do is we loop over all blocks, we loop over all trials of each block, and then normally we don't loop over all the stimuli, but we simply present them simultaneously, obviously. But in this example, we just loop over our stimuli and present them, present them, and that's then it. So doing it, we had one block with one stimulus. Uh, with, uh, we had one experiment with one block, with one trial, with one stimulus. All white. Um, yes, blocks and trials can have factors. And a factor is simply just a key value pair storing information. So. In, our, uh, in the Simon task, but as I showed you, there was the factor if the block is green or left, and the factor if the color of the block is green or red. Uh, left or white, green or red. So that's useful, and we have to do this such that we can uh, restore information uh, throughout the experiment, and for example, also log it correctly, because we, want, we of course need to log if the block was to the left or to the right, and to do so, we have to simply specify it as a factor. Um, so let's show that uh, the normal stuff, blah, blah. We initialize, we make and preload our blank screen. Then we make a block, and this, fact, and this block has the factor that the color is green. So in our first block, we have one factor, and that is color green. Then we make a trial. In this trial, we again have um, a stimulus, and this stimulus here is green, just like um, the... Uh, design uh, just like the factor for our block says. We add the stimulus to our, uh, the stimulus to our trial, the trial to our block, the block to our experiment, and then we make a second block. This has the factor color is red, so we choose for our stimulus, we choose the color red, add the new stimulus to our trial, um, this trial to our second block, and the block to our experiment. And then in our main structure, we simply again loop over all blocks, and we can use this just like we use the block.set factor here. Um, we can use block.get factor. So this simply restores what we set in this key value pair. So in the first block, this will simply say, now we're printing green circles. And then in the second block, we'll print, now we're printing red circles. And then again, we loop over all trials in our block, which is again only one. Um, present the stimulus, wait a bit. Present the blank screen, wait a bit. So. Of course, this doesn't work again, so we'll restart the kernel. 
So now we're printing green, and now we're printing red. Oh yeah, I added it twice. So we actually do loop over the trials because I added two copies each here. So this add trial simply has a copies equals. And um, that's really nice, but pay attention, keep in mind that it adds the very same stimulus. And if you want, for example, to, to, uh, if you want to present a random number and you add this random number to the, term, to the block with copies equals two, it's not a random number anymore, but the same number twice. So if you want to present random stuff, don't do it with copies, but well, regenerate the random number uh, again and again. Yes, uh, this obviously is uh, a bit long and a bit stupid. This could be better done in a loop, and normally, of course, we do that, so we set blocks and trials algorithmically in a loop. So this is the very same thing, just in a loop. Um, so we want to have two blocks, one where we say the color is green and where we actually use the color green. So in the first iteration where name is green, color is the green constant. Um, then we make a block and simply use our green color here again um, as the name for our block. And as factor, we use the color string again. And then, um, oh, the, it's actually not the same. And then we have, so this, the block now has the factor that the color is either green or red. So in the first block, the color is going to be green. In the second block, the color is going to be red. And then in each block, we have two trials, one where the stimulus is left and one where the stimulus is right. So we can, just as much as we can set factors for a block, we can set factors for trials, semicolon uh, trial dot set factor. And then um, we say position here. So this here says then position left and the second iteration position right. We present a stimulus at either negative 300 or positive 300, at the stimulus to our trial, the trial to our block, the block to the blocks each to our experiment. And then again, the simple structure, we loop over both blocks, we loop over both trials in each block, and we present the stimuli. So this will show uh, First, a green stimulus on the left, then a green on the right, then a red on the left, and then a red on the right. Green left, green right, left red, uh, red left, left right. Red, right. Okay. Um, oh, oh, it didn't crash. Oh, now it crashed. Um, so, to show this again, so to show this in the debugger, because you know the debugger now, and I can show you stuff in the debugger. Um, now I'm not in any position of the debugger because I didn't press any button. Wait, where am I? Oh, I'm still presenting the time and time chart, so that makes sense. So the debugger, actually, this one. Um, so now we're at control.start, and I again don't see anything about my monitor. So, so that's just look into it. So this here is our experiment, and we see that our experiment is this underscore blocks. So it starts with an underscore, so we're not supposed to change this variable. And instead, we're going to use, we, uh, we're encouraged to use the um, get block um, to add block, I mean. So we use this uh, experiment dot add block. So we're not supposed to use this variable, but of course we can look at it. And we see our experiment has two blocks. And it also nicely presents me um, a string of uh, what, the block, what, what is the block. And first of all, it's the name. So it's block zero with green stimuli. That's the name we gave it, so the capitalized green and the block two, uh, block one rather, with red stimuli. And then it also tells me what my factors are. So here I have one factor, and that namely is that the color is green. I have two trials here, where trial zero and trial one. And the trials also have factors. So just, just, just let's just look into our block. First of all, we see there's an underscore factors. So again, we're not supposed to use this variable, but instead we're, gonna we're supposed to use the get factor and set factor methods. So it, has, it starts with an underscore. We're not supposed to change the name. That's why they all start with an underscore. And we see the block has trials, namely two. And we see already um, the trials here also have factors. 
So this is, has position left, and the other trial has position right. And then in the trials, we can look even at the stimuli, and we see that in each trial, there's a rectangle. And this one is, has the color RGB, so this one is green. And I think it will also show me the position somewhere. Yeah, position, negative 300, zero. And our second, so this only has one stimulus, but our second trial also has one stimulus. And we see this one is also green, uh, red, green, blue, RGB, yes. Um, but it's at position positive 300, zero. And if we looked into the other block, um, we would see that they would be red. Yes, so our experiment has this blocks variable. Um, these are between, between subject factors, bet between subjects, yeah. Um, we didn't set any, so it's gonna be the same for every subject. And then we see there's a lot of other stuff we don't know, so there's this underscore keyboard, so it does have a keyboard we can use, it does have a mouse we can use, the name I simply said my experiment, it does have a screen we can use, or rather we can use methods from, and so on and so on. So there's much stuff which experiment made, me, made for me here. Um, and yeah, and if I then execute it, well, you're gonna see, Oh yeah, now the focus is back to the window and I have to press something. And now the focus is back on the debug idea. And now, well, I didn't execute this line yet. So now I see what is my block here, and my block is the one with the green stimuli. And then if I had um, both open at the same time, now it will show me the green ones, now the debugger gets the focus again, and now go one line further and ask what my block is, which I mean my block is the red stimuli, right? It's always so much easier to look at stuff in the debugger. And now I'm done. So we're calling control.end and my experiment ends. Okay, so one experiment, several blocks, several trials, one or more stimuli. Okay, um, blocks also provide the possibility to shuffle trials, so we simply has to have this uh, shuffle trials. Um, I can even specify uh, the maximum amount of repetitions. I'm gonna get to that later. Um, so we're not supposed to repeat too many trials inside a block. I will get to this shuffling in a bit, or rather at the very end of the lecture. Okay, like I said, we can use the design package alone and export the designs for other libraries. So. Let's imagine we had here a condition which is A, B, C. We make, um, so we have a trial. So we have, first of all, we have one block. In this one block, we have um, three trials with the condition A, B, and C. We add, we add each one five times. Then we copy the block using simply block.copy. And in the first block, um, so then we shuffle the first block, we shuffle the second block, we add both blocks to experiments, and then we simply save our design. So we don't need experiment.control, we simply need experiment.design. So I don't even know why I'm uh, importing control here. It's obviously not necessary. And then once I exported it, um, yeah, stimuli, I cannot add stimuli to a CSV, so I have to uh, find some workaround for that. But if we're looking at it, now it exported it nicely as a CSV, so I can also use pandas to load that. Um, actually, that looks nicer. Uh, oh yeah, right. Um, it's a commented CSV, so I can't, I'm not allowed to use um, simply read CSV because the first two lines I comment, but I can simply tell pandas that there are comments and all comments start with a hash. So I'm gonna import it like, uh, load it like this. And then, well, what do we see here? We have, so what did I say? We have three different conditions with five copies each and then two blocks of that. So we must have, so it must have a length of 30. Yes, indeed it does. And then there's the first 15 are the first block 
So block count and block ID. We didn't shuffle the blocks in our experiment, so the block count and the block ID is the same. First 15 are the first block, and then we have the second block. And then in each block, we have trials, 0 until 14. Um, the trials are actually shuffled, so the trial count and the trial ID is different. We see that we see the first of all the fifth one, and then the seventh one, and then the ninth one. And here in the second block, we have first the first one, then the third one, and so on and so on. And then we see what condition we have in each block. And then again, I can, when I'm shuffling the trials, I can go from max, oops, that's not my keyboard. I see already that I have um, three times B in a row here. Um, that's maybe not too good. I may not want that, so I can simply say max repetitions equals two. Oh, I can't. Oh yeah, it's not for the block. I'm going to get to that later in a second anyway. So yeah, um, there are caveats when shuffling. I'm going to get to these caveats and shuffling at the very end anyway. Um, never show something you didn't plan, Chris. Okay. Ah. I already use pandas anyway. Okay, so as much for normal stuff, then I said there are the between subjects vectors, so between subjects, BWS. And like I said, so in many studies, you want to prevent, present different stimuli for different subjects, and these are then between subject vectors um, based on their subject ID. Um, let's load our BWS study CSV, or rather let's look at it first. Um, yeah, that's definitely the wrong delimiter. So this is what it looks like. This is actually um, something I did as a EV for uh, Mingya Liu at the um, Computer Linguistics Department. And this experiment was about differences between the German conditionals, false and when. So there's always the same sentence. I mean, it's not necessarily too smart to, to like, it, it's, it takes a bit of storage to save it like this. But we see some sentence, Dennis kaufte einen Blumenstrauß zu seiner Freundin, die Verkäuferin hat ihm gesagt, and then there's the condition either when or false. So when es Rosen, when es Narzissen gibt, gibt es Rosen, or falls es Rosen, Narzissen gibt, gibt es Rosen. Um, two times each, because then the condition here says um, either es gab Narzissen und es gab Rosen, or es gab keine Narzissen und es gab Rosen. And then there's one question, which is simply there to test if um, the person actually read the question well enough, because that's a really easy question, because we obviously didn't buy chocolate, but flowers. Um, but what was measured was not the answer to this question anyway. There was just a rule of subjects who didn't read the question. Um, but we measured the reading time at this very sentence, because the uh, theory was, was that uh, in when conditions, it's more natural to accept no, wait, this false. So, in the fi so false is less likely. So if there are no Nazism, but there are roses, you're going to have a shorter reading time in the false condition because um, you're assuming like uh, this is like more of a modus ponens than a when because a when is for most Germans, it's a genau dann when. So not if it's not the single error for classical logic, yeah? So normally, when and false would both be the classical logic symbol error, which has like this tooth table, A, B, and then the thingy. So we have, so we have one and zero. So if A, then B, that's false. If A, then B, that's true. But if A is zero, doesn't matter what B needs to be, zero anyway. So this is the official false. Uh, this is the official when. But Germans see it more like a genau dann when. So uh, in, in, in all cases, which, so this would be a zero, one, zero, no wait, uh, one, zero, something like this. So yeah, differences there, it doesn't matter, that was totally unimportant for what I'm explaining here, just we have different conditions. So we show a few participants, we show the when case, a few, partici few participants, we show the false case, and then um, that's combined with the two by two here, so with the two different conditions here. Two times two, four different conditions. Just looking at it here, so, um, yeah, what does our CSV tell us? Well, it has the number of the item, which is one for this first one, 
two for the second run. I just stripped it down a bit. Um, then we have, if it was a practice trial, so these are all practice trials. We started with a bunch of practice trials. Um, we have different conditions here. This is condition one, two, and then five and six. They're original eight conditions, but I just stripped it down to be shorter. And then the sentences. Oops. Okay, but this needs between subject factors because some of the, fact, some of the subjects we want to uh, give the false conditions and some of the subjects we want to give the when condition. Okay, so um, we're, reading the C uh, we're reading our CSV here. This is just because I wanted to have it as correct data type. That's why it's a bit longer. Um, and then, yeah, we're setting some uh, settings here. So we're not in develop mode, but we want to be in windowed mode because otherwise my dual screen setup crashes. Uh, we don't have the initialized delay, so we save 10 seconds. Yay. Um, and then, yes, what we're doing then here so this is just, I didn't originally make this study an experiment. Um, if I did, I would have probably have another kind of CSV file here, which wouldn't look as stupid as this one does. But this is just, if you have this CSV file, this is how we would load it into experiment with the between subject factors. So um, we're grouping this data frame by condition. Haha, we're using pandas, and we're actually needing pandas. So we have um, the different conditions here. Uh, which is, well, one, two, five, and six. And then we are going through all of these conditions and make a block for each of those conditions. So this is just one way how to work with this. So in this, what I did here is I made a block for all conditions. I added all the blocks to the experiment. And then I made this between subject factors and I deleted the blocks which were not needed for this condition. Okay, this is one way to make that. It's not the smartest way. Um, it's just one way how we would incorporate this between subject factors, for example. So I made a block for every condition. And in the end, we're going to show each subject only one block. Because I want to show the subjects um, where I want to show condition one, where I only want to show condition one, and so on and so on. Oh, oh we almost died. And... Yeah, so we're making a block for all the conditions. Um, we set the factor where this is condition and then we have a number. And then we're simply iterating through uh, our, our data, which is simply the grouped by condition, so the sub data frame, which contains only this one condition. And in this, so we're adding all the sentences of this one condition here. So we make one trial for all rows of this. So we have one row, so we have two rows for condition one, for example. So this is condition one, and this is condition one. So we're only looking at these in this block. We're adding both of these rows. So we add a trial for each of these rows, set the factor of the item number, which is simply well, the number, which we set somewhere here. So this item number is the same no matter which condition we had. So this is how we restore which well, which of the sentences um, we actually looked at. Um, so yeah, one or two, or three, if we have, because we only have three sentences. And then we make a stimulus for all of the sentences. Yeah, we add the stimuli, the, we add the stimuli to our trial, such that now we have a trial with seven consecutive sentences as stimulus. Yeah, we add the trial to this block, and then we add the second and the third trial to the block, and then we add the block for this very condition to our experiment. And now our experiment has four blocks with three trials each, with these seven sentences each. But like I said, I don't want to show all subjects the very same, all sentences, but I only want to show in this example, like I said, it's all a bit dumped down, which is why it looks a bit stupid of why we do this, but I dumped down the original study because it was a bit longer and there were a, different, a bunch of other conditions. So um, it may look a bit stupid here. But then we had this between subject factors, and we either have the, we have the difference between the false when condition, so there's the when and the false, and then there's the gap gap. So there's the gap, gap gap, and gap nicht gap. So yeah, so this is either when or false, and then gab gab and gab nicht gab. Oh man. 
Okay, yeah. So we do this all before we call control.start because after we call control.start, we have our subject ID. This is also why I didn't use develop mode here because in develop mode, you don't have a subject ID. So uh, I want to be sure that for different subject IDs, this works the correct way. So I can't use the develop mode here, but I use the window mode anyway. So we start here. And once we are at this very line, so at the line after control.start, we know we now know, um, experiment now knows which um, conditions it adds. So it knows there are two different conditions, so between, fa between, um, su between subjects factors, with two conditions each. So experiment knows, knows now that every fourth it has to give one combination of these conditions. Okay, and then I have, so I'm, uh, I can use this get permuted between subject factor condition for its when condition. So this then returns when condition if the subject number is divisible by two and false condition else. And this one returns gap condition if the number is divisible by four. No, wait. So in 50% of cases, this one is false condi when condition, 50 it's false. 50% of subjects this year's gap gap condition, 50% it's not. Yeah? And then depending on each, I'm just deleting the conditions which don't fit. And then in the end, so and then I'm just, so I'm just having this uh, to delete as a, a, a list, right? Think it have it, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a set. And then I'm simply removing the blocks yeah, of, uh, of the unfitting conditions, such that here I'm left with only one block, and that's then um, where the block the subject is actually going to get. And I also print which one they have, such that we can see this. And then again, normal stuff, loop over all blocks, only one in this case, loop over all files, and then simply show sentence after sentence. Okay, this was a bit complex, I guess, so I'm just going to show it to you in the debugger. Everything looks nicer in the debugger. So let's just run it at first. So this is what happens when we run it. So let's say subject number is one. Yes. Ready? And then let's first look at the print now. Let's, but the, sub, but, uh, the experiment is going to start anyway. So we see we have condition one here. And condition one is the gap gap condition and the when condition. And then just iterates over all, all sentences. It's real quick. And then it's already done. Bumps, done. Okay, now if I want it again, I'm going to enter subject number two, which experiment also has nicely available for me, which is nice. And then let's look at the print here at first, and then at the sentences. And then we see we are now using condition five. So it just says, I don't know why it makes it random, and I don't get condition two in this case, but you get the point. And condition five is the gap, nicht gap, and the when condition. Okay. So let's look at it in the debugger just uh, to make sure what I said to you was true. Uh, so what do I want to print here? So let's print, let's look at this. So these are all the conditions. So like I said, I grouped them by condition. So now what I'm getting here is this subdata frame um, where the condition here is one, the subdata frame where condition here is two, and then five and six. So these are simply all the rows where the condition is two. And these are then my conditions, my conditions are simply a list of that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a data frame group by object, but we can loop over them, and then we simply get uh, so now if we looped over it, now we're getting the first element. So now we're getting all the ones where um, condition is one at first. So what are we doing here? We set the factor condition equals one. So now um, if I look at lock, so this window has a certain height. This screen shows it to me, but if I, I, I don't know. Okay, so we see here now um, we have some block, and the block has a factor condition equals one, and it also has the correct name. 
And then we're going through all the sentences here. So or rather through all the lines. So sense now is a series of, well, simply this very line. So one of the three, one, three ones where condition is one. Okay, we make a new trial for each sentence, set this vector item number and then sense item number. So we if we now look at send, oh no, uh, if we now look at T, that was the name of our trial. Um, this has the vector item number one. And then we simply add all the stimuli here. And then look, let's look at T again here. Now we see that T has a bunch of stimuli, namely seven, and then each one, can I see it? Yes, has uh, the text, and that's the first sentence, second sentence, and so on and so on. And we're doing this not only for condition one, but we're also doing it for uh, condition two. So now our T, I went one step through it, so now our T contains the, the second sentences, now the third ones, and then now we're making, oh no, ah, I'm sorry, I see it. But yeah, now we made all the conditions, so if we now look at EXP, we see that our experiment has four blocks, yeah? With the condition one, two, five, and six, and yeah, then when we're calling control.start, so now the focus is gonna come back to my experiment window, so let's say subject number three, that's fine for me. Uh, shit, is I wrong here? Yeah, so now if I click, now I got the focus back to the debugger, and now let's look at what this names to ID, it's simply, uh, so this names to ID, ID is simply that uh, the block ID, so it maps simply the block name to the block ID because we can delete on, we can delete blocks only by ID. This is what we're doing here, right? Find block needs the ID, which is why we need this mapping from um, block name to ID. And then let's look at what this year. So I don't even know if it says certainly um, what like how it maps the number to this factor. Um, we didn't randomize the factors, interesting. But we see here that we have these between, uh, between subjects vectors, and that's either, that's like the first one with two, um, two possibilities and the second one with two possibilities. And then let's look at the result of this. And for subject number three, this here is Files condition. So if we had a, another subject number, it would return another, it would return eventually event condition. And then, yeah, I'm updating this to delete here because in the files condition, I want to delete conditions five, uh, one and five. And then for the gap, gap nicht, we want to delete conditions. Um, I don't know what was the case here. So let's look at to delete here. To delete is now condition one, five, and six. And let's look at our experience experiment.blocks, um, so condition two. So apparently we have, so subject number, whatever this was, three I think, gets um, the when condition, no, the false condition with the gap gap. Okay, so we simply remove all the blocks um, we don't want to have. Zack, 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 zack such that when we print this stuff, we see I'm getting condition two. Yes, I deleted all the other ones, and condition two is the gap gap with the files. And then we're looping over all the stuff. So if I now look, look at experiment.blocks, again, I see I only have this one condition left, and this is the one I'm getting. So if I'm running here, um, it will give me files, gap gap. So again, zack. Yeah, so that's it. And then control.end is going to get hit. Oh no, second sentence comes up. Yeah, and then we're done. 
between subject vectors. Okay, this is one way to, to use it. You shouldn't need to create all blocks and then delete the ones, but you can use it in all other ways that uh, make sense to you. All right, as much for the experiment design. Any questions? I didn't expect any. And yeah, then there are uh, just the very last things, which is um, what we didn't look at is measuring time, data logging, and then exporting the data and serial triggers I can't show you anyway. But yeah, measuring time. So uh, accurate timing of stimuli and O as well as measuring response time is really important. So we need to be aware of how we measure time and using simply just one like Googling how to get system time or something and then using that. Um, it's not a good idea because it's, it can be really imprecise and we need to be precise when measuring response times. Like a P300 or something appears after 300 milliseconds. If you wasted 100 milliseconds by uh, using a bad timer or something, then you're not going to be accurate at all. So let's look at the accuracy of this timer. So this timer is, accu is, accu is accurate, so we're sleeping for one second here. Uh, we're simply using time.time .time and then the difference here between the time well, after I waited for a second and before that, I see it waited for more than one second. Uh, yes, this is in part um, due to, for example, time.time, .time, like calling the function takes a few microseconds because of the scheduling, because the scheduler knew, ah, your Python tasks are sleeping now, so I'm just going to give um, CPU resources from this to other tasks, and just again, eventually, I'm going to go back to you. This all takes time. And this is also responsible for a bit of this impreciseness here, but also simply calling time.time .time is also not too precise. So we see there are only two digits after the comma are correct. So generally a good idea, Python's time function may not be as accurate as we think. And then uh, this is, again, this is obviously depending on your operating system. And for Linux and Mac, time.time, .time, so simply this one's precision is around plus minus 0 0.001 mic milliseconds. So this is milliseconds we're talking about, so this is pretty precise. But on Windows, the precision for this is plus minus 16 milliseconds, which is already a bit more, I think. So this is due to clock implementation problems due to process interrupts. So like this interrupts is like when the scheduler decide, like the scheduler is the part of the operating system deciding which process gets which CPU resources at what, at what time, because multitasking is a really hard thing, and this, that's what 99% of the work of the operating system. And then that gets more complex and eventually like if your process waits, then um, it's gonna allocate resources for other stuff and eventually it's gonna need it back and that needs an interrupt and the interrupt is really slow in Windows, okay? If you want to uh, know exactly what this does, so here's a stack overflow thread where some people compared them and this is um, the Windows, uh, the Microsoft developer information about how to actually use accurate timing. So if you're calling Python's time.time, .time, this is simply a call to the operating systems, hey, give me your system time, right? And like, on de depending on conditions, it's going to use a different um, operating system uh, function to get the time, and time.time .time simply doesn't get the best one. So time.time, .time, generally not necessarily a good idea, especially on Windows, full stop. Okay. For measuring time differences then, Python, use, Python provides also the performance counter that simply automatically uses the most accurate measure of time your system provides. So again, on Windows, this simply uses like some, uh, like some kind of the system clock and time.performance counter is simply smart enough to take the operating system time function which is the most accurate. So in case of Windows, one that doesn't rely on the Windows clock, which time.time .time does. And let's look at it if we're using the same thing with time.performance counter. Well, we see that this is almost as imprecise as time.time, .time, but that's only the case because I use Linux, and on Linux, time.time .time uses the best counter anyway already. So time.performance counter and time.time .time on Linux is the same, on Windows it's not. But keep in mind there are differences among CPUs and even operating systems. Um, especially, for example, using time.clock, which works completely different on Unix-like systems and on Windows. And the definition of processor time is even different because, like I said, when it schedules to another process, 
um, this doesn't count uh, in Windows as time used on this task and on other operating systems it does. So that's a difference of a few seconds if you're sleeping or something. Okay, so this may only count the time spent in this process. So let's use time.clock. First of all, it's going to be a deprecated warning because this is deprecated anyway. What do I see here? Well, I call the time.clock and then I sleep for a second and this took less than a second. Yes, because while I was gone, like I said, when I'm sleeping, my operating system says, meh, your task doesn't need any resources now anyway, so I'm just going to switch to other tasks and do that and look back later as soon as I get the interrupt. And this is why we spent almost no time in this task because the operating system spent time doing other stuff um, in the meantime. So process time and time.clock, which as we see is deprecated anyway, um, count only the time spent in this process, which is definitely not what we're going to take. Okay, so uh, yeah, we, we are a bit more precise. We see there's one digit after the comma now more correct when we account for these, uh, for these unaccuracies. So this here takes the process time and this here takes the normal time. And then we simply, uh, we're moving, so we're subtracting the time spent in our process from the time we measured all around. Yeah? And this then is closer because it, like calling these functions, like I said, also takes time and this takes a bit into account of removing the stuff from this. This is a bit closer to one second. All of this, just to show you, timing is not too precise. Um, full stop. So Pygame and timing, Pygame at least is explicit about the precision of its own stopwatch. So there's simply a Pygame.timer resolution constant. And on my system, Pygame will tell me I'm accurate to at least 10 milliseconds. So that's very nice of high game. And yeah, in experiment, um, the measuring, the, the experiment measure, time measurement system also uses automatically the most accurate timer on the operating system. And it does even provide its own stopwatch, which you should use at all times. So always use experiment.clock instead of working with the um, performance counter or just any kind of counter. Okay, since Python Web C functions for getting the system time, the accuracy is even more precise than milliseconds, which is the unique experiment uses. So according to their own paper, uh, they only, they say they have milli millisecond precision, so we can only look at the milliseconds anyway, and they are more than millisecond accurate, so this is really nice. Okay, let's make our stimuli demo again. Let's hope it works. And then, um, yeah, this is just, we use experiment.clock.wait instead of time.sleep. Did it show something? I think it did show something, right? My screen crashed. Yeah. Okay. And then what's more, I think I already told you that on Tuesday, experiment synchronizes visual stimulus presentation to the refresh rate of my display. Pygame does not do this. And like my display has, for example, if I have a 30 hertz display, my display is only um, updating the contents of my screen 30 times per second. 30 times per second is already a few milliseconds. So if I don't know when the stimulus occurs, I'm off, I'm maximally off by one thirtieth of a second, which is quite a bit if you're looking at milliseconds and at response time, which are supposed to be really quick. So on, if you're using Pygame or something else, then experiment, the, stimulus, the time the stimulus is allegedly presented, so when, my, when the process told the graphics card to please present it on the display, it's not the time we actually saw it because the graphic card, like I said, it's like uh, the screen rather, only updates 30 times a second and it takes a bit of time. And experiment synchronizes this to the actual refresh rate of the display such that we don't lose this 1 30th or 1 60th or however fast the display is of a second. Um, so yeah, Pygame has several milliseconds uncertainty. Um, yeah, ah yeah, I said, yeah, I even calculated it. Whew, I don't have to do it in my head. So on a 60 hertz screen, that's 70 milliseconds, which is already quite a bit. Audio latency is even way worse, again, because um, the sound cards is a lot slower anyway. And in experiment, that's at least what they say in their paper, their C report latency is less than a second. So if you're using uh, EEG triggers, um, then that's pretty precise, which is necessary in EEG, of course. 
Yeah. So in the benchmark, which they did themselves, response time was two milliseconds of visual and 20 milliseconds of auditory stimuli, which is acceptable, I think. Yes, uh, last thing about experiment and timing to make sure that all stimulus are accurately presented precisely on time. We have this preload, which I already explained to you in the present function, and they return the number of milliseconds they took to preload and present it. So what we're supposed to do all the time in an experiment is whenever we're waiting, um, so normally, yeah, we would first wait for, um, so we didn't know about this. This is how we would normally do it. Um, we would wait for 500 milliseconds, and then we would present our fixed cross, and then we would, for example, preload our target, and the same thing down here too. And this is not precise because this preloading and the presenting take a few milliseconds each themselves. So to be really precise, um, we should take into account the time this took. So this here is imprecise because this waits for 500 milliseconds here and then takes another, let's say, 10 milliseconds to present this. Um, so it's not too long anyway, but it's, it's a bit. So this took one millisecond, but a fixed course is really easy and fast to present. So if we had more stimuli and complex, more complex stimuli, um, this would be a lot more. But yeah, so we're off by one millisecond all the time here. And this here simply incorporates um, that as well. So this will wait only another 499 minus whatever the time to preload this took. So this here is more accurate. And like this, the times using to present a preload, you should always subtract from the time you want to wait such that you're really only waiting this 1,000 milliseconds. Precision, yes. OK. Um, and then the almost last thing, data logging um, and experiment automatically after the experiment ended, after we ended it using this controller, and two files will automatically be saved, an event log file uh, that contains all events that happened, which is a detailed description of the experiment design, include the complete listing of trials if we didn't export it to a CSV, all the times the stimulus was presented, the I.O. occurred, and device communications occurred, and like basically everything. And that's a really huge file. Uh, and it also saves this data file, which we explicitly have to uh, create. I'm going to show in a second of how. Uh, I'm going to show in a second how. And that contains only what we manually saved. So we did start a few experiments in this directory. So we see there are already this events folder and this data folder. And so they are named after the file, but if I start them from the IPython notebook, um, they just got the name IPython kernel launcher. So they have file, timestamp, subject number, I think. Uh, an hour ago, I showed you the Simon task. So let's look at that. And we see there's a lot written in this event file. So first of all, it gives me a bunch of information of the version, of the date I started it, of the display size, my operating system, all kinds of stuff. Uh, also, the complete design. So, if, uh, so this is the very same thing um, then, uh, as if we simply saved the design to a CSV ourselves. So if you forget that, experiment does that for you. It's really nice, blah, blah, blah. And then a complete log of everything that happened. So this is some certain way of presenting the, um, the system time. So at this system time, the design was locked, which is this bunch here. And then at the very same time, so a few milliseconds off, the experiment started. Then a few milliseconds later, the stimulus was presented. Blah, blah, blah. What was the nine here? Uh, detail, OK. No, wait, value. OK, value. Uh, ah, yeah, we presented. I don't know what we presented here. So then we received a keyboard press, presented something else, received a keyboard press. So this is really, really accurate. Um, and also we see that it's rather hard to uh, recreate whatever the experiment was here. So um, 
Yeah, we can't really nice. So this really gives a lot of information. It's really useful when experiment does it. Uh, but normally we would rather lock data ourselves, and this can also be done um, by doing what I am showing you now. So yeah, both are the comment CSV files, so they can be expected with most CSV words. And with pandas, when skipping the commented both simply saying comment equals hash. Okay, so let's add something to the data file, and for that um, I have the attribute experiment.data, and I can simply add experiment.data variable name equals and then some variable name and then we simply experiment.data.add and then the values. So these here are the variable names that will be the header of my CSV file, right? And then in each trial, so at all times when I want to add something, I can simply call experiment.data.add and then it will say name one equals value one and name equals value two. So this is what it would look like. This is response time.py. Um, so what do we see here? Blah, blah, blah. Making all this stuff. Um, making, like preloading the stimuli such that we don't take the time here anymore. We have only one block. And then we have a random waiting time. Yeah? And we set this as a factor for our trials. And then we show the circle, we add the stimulus to our trial, the trial to our experiment, the, uh, to our block, the block to our experiment. And then, like I said, we have to specify here the data variable names. So we have waiting time and response time. So we want to have two columns in our data file, namely the waiting time, which was what we saved here, the response time, which is where the time the user will take. And then in our experiment, again, we loop over all blocks, we loop over all trials in each block, we present the fixed cross. And then we're waiting for as many seconds as the waiting time here was. And then um, we present it. And then we wait until the user presses space. And then simply we call this experiment.data.add. First of all, we add the waiting time. So waiting time equals get factor waiting time. And response time equals however long the user took to press the keyboard here. OK, so this is like. Like basically also an experiment, uh, how does the response time correlate with the waiting time? I would assume that if you're waiting for a few milliseconds, then the response time is much quicker than if you're waiting for a few seconds. Okay, so let's do this. Let's run our experiment. Uh, I'm not too good. Okay, let's wait really long for this one such that we see response time will be long. So the response time of the last one should be really long. So now let's look first of all at our events file, blah, blah, blah. We see this was our design. We had one block with 10 trials with these waiting times. And then, like the design file tells us, at this time the stimulus was presented, and at this time the stimulus was the keyboard um, press of space 32 space was received. So we could even uh, we could even subtract these two times, and this would also get the right thing. But yeah, the data file, uh, the events file, is really annoying to work with. The data file looks much nicer. So the data file also gives us a few comments here. It tells us the block, and then, uh, well, it's only one block, and this has 10 trials, and these are the waiting times commented as a co commented part, which is really nice. And then this is what we saved, right? We saved the waiting time and the response time. So first one to be long waiting time, this is my response time, blah, blah, blah. And for the last one, I said I wait really long, so I waited three and a half seconds. I see this here. Okay. Um, Again, this, of course, looks nicer in pandas. So yeah, and this is something we can actually work with, right? It says subject ID such that if I merge these files, I already have the subject ID here too. It was subject ID one. And then here I have the waiting time and the response time. Yeah, 
again, I did that already. OK. Um, now I think this is the very last thing before we make some thing that puts everything together. Serial triggers. So again, if we're working with an EEG, uh, all we need to do is experiment to sell triggers to my EEG at the right time. And this can be done with serial reports. I can unfortunately not show this because I don't have any serial thing added uh, to my laptop. So for example, I don't have this COM1 device. So if I look at my devices and then at the COM1 device, my operating system will tell me you don't have a COM1 device. So whatever I show you now will just fail because I'm sending data to my COM1 device. How do I do this? Um, we simply say experiment.serial port and then we select from experiment.io, we select some serial port and namely COM1. Because I don't have a COM1, uh, it will throw an error. Uh, what, there's one thing we didn't add to our requirements, unfortunately, and this is here um, Pi serial. So if you want to use serial triggers, you need to pip install Pi serial. I've added that to the lectures environment by now, but you don't, didn't have it before. But you don't need it anyway because, well, we obviously don't, like, you don't have an EEG lying around just as much as I don't. So we can't work with this in this class anyway. But yeah, so I have now an experiment at C report. And then in my experiment, I can simply experiment at C report dot write and then send, for example, in this case, I simply said send one byte. So the one as a byte as a character to my EEG. Uh, or I can also use, uh, I can also see report.read. And this is how we would work with this. Can't show you because I never did it because I don't have access to an EEG. Uh, but this is simply the C report triggers. Part of Pygame can be do, used just as much as all other stuff, also locked as event. Okay. Um, and then lastly, um, we're looking at exporting data. And this is actually an error in experiment. So let's try this in the debugger because this is actually a bug in there. Um, the bug is not there on GitHub anymore, but in version 0.9 of experiment, which you're downloading from the Python package index, there will be um, this error. And that's in this write concatenated data. So let's, uh, what's the name of this? Export underscore data dot pi export underscore data.py, let's run it. And it will tell me there's an error. And in this case, like I told you last week, 99% no, of time the error is not in the packages you're using, but in your code. But I mean, this is my code. So I'm simply, what I want to do here is I'm looking at all these data here. So I'm looking at this very folder and then taking all um, data files that start with Simon task short, so these four here, and I want to merge them to this one data.csv. Yeah? But there's an error in experiment, and if we look at it, it's a really obvious error. I don't know why it was in there. Like I said, it's fixed by now on the Git version, so as soon as they make a new version of experiment, it's going to be fixed. But we see here that this underscore version variable takes the numpy version dot version and then splits this at the point. So numpy is version, I don't know, 3.6 point something, yeah, as a string and then it splits it and then that has the string three. And then it compares this string here, which is certainly a string because the split function returns strings with an integer and that throws an error. Um, again, really nice, there's a nice way where we you can use the postmortem debugging. So, uh, Control Shift F8. I'm breaking at exceptions. And then I'm going in there with the debugger. And my postmortem debugging is going to tell me, yeah, here's the error. And now, well, I can simply um, just execute this part here in my evaluate, in my evaluate window. Yeah. Now you see, this is false. Well, because. What is this version zero? It's a string. And what is the part we're comparing this? Not a string. So if you want to use this very function, 
um, either you load the new experiment version down from the Python package index, or you change this simply yourself by simply saying, well, int version equals run and end version version is 106. So if we now execute this again, this export data, now it works. No, it doesn't. Yeah, but that's another, that's my mistake somewhere here. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever. That was my mistake. Um, it doesn't work. That's another mistake. Anyway, the one we had before was fixed, yeah? So we fixed the neighbor of the experiment package. If it wouldn't be fixed on GitHub already, we could now send, um, we could now uh, fork the repository and make a clone uh, and, and make a pull request and we get our GitHub contributing count up. I was too late for this because it was already fixed. Um, but yeah, so now it works. Uh, it found sub four subjects because I have these four files here and it reads all of them and simply adds them to one um, data.csv. Now I have somewhere here, I have this data.csv which is simply the merged version of this data.csv. So now I have, that's why it was nice that it saved the subject ID too because now I have these here. And I have more files with the same subject ID. That's really weird. I just overwrote it sometime. But yeah, this is what it generally does. Exporting data. So I'm looking at data.csv um, with a nice index. It's only, ah, okay, we only had two. There was an, ah, there was an error in the other two ones. So we only had two subjects because I executed it twice here and I changed something apparently. And yeah, now it has the same thing for the subject that is. And now we could analyze this stuff. We're gonna do this in the next, no, in like three weeks or something. We're gonna get one thing from start to finish, make an experiment and then analyze it and make nice plots and then print it. And that's what we're doing in the very last week. So I'm not doing it right now because now we're only making the experiments. All right, but having seen all this is enough to code experiments. So let's look at the Simon effect, which is what we already did before here, which says that reaction times are faster and, reaction, and reactions themselves more accurate when the stimulus occurs in the same relative location as the response, even if the stimulus location is irrelevant to the task. Okay, so this is, I think I just simply quoted this from the paper, but how would we build something up when we have this kind of task description? And the task description, in two experimental tasks, yeah, two tasks you see already, participants have to, respond to, have to respond to a rectangle on the screen according to its color, red or green. So we see, aha, there's a factor red or green by pressing the left or right arrow key on the computer's keyboard. Additionally, the position can either be left or right. Aha, we see there's another factor. Each trial, aha, trial, we start with the presentation of relaxation course for 500 milliseconds, followed by the rectangle that will remain in the display until a response is given between trials a blank screen is shown for three seconds. Each block contains 128 trials in a random order. The two tasks will differ in the mapping of the responses, which button to press for which color, which will be shown to the participant as a brief instruction at the beginning of each block. The order of the task will be counterbalanced over participants. The experiment is a two by two by two by two factorial design with the within subject factors color, green left, so it even is really precise here position and task, yeah, this is two by two by two, as well as the between subjects factor task order. So for one, for few of them it's green first, for a few of them it's red first. So two by two by two by two. And yeah, so this is uh, two, four, eight, 16. Once you have 128 trials, so in the end, we're showing 128, uh, 32, 46. So we're showing each trial four times, I think, right? Okay, so this here is our description. And this is then what we make of it. So we read, aha, it's obviously called Simon Task. So we're naming our experiment Simon Task. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I said 
it said we need a fixed cross, so let's preload our fix. Let's make and preload our fixed cross. We always need a blank screen. And uh, it said that it, the subject can press left or right. So the only keys we need are wet, uh, uh, left and right. So we have these two response keys. OK? And then it said, well, the mapping here is either left for green or left for wet. And then we make a block for this. So we have one block for left equals green and one block for left equals wet. Um, we save that as a factor for our block. And then, well, I showed you part of this already. So where, first of all, so this is our first. So this is the first two. This is the second two. This is the third two. Um, so we have left and right. We have red and green. We make a trial for, for all of these. We save what the position and the color what was. Uh, we make a rectangle at this, at this position with this color. We add this, and we add each one, each one we add two times to the block. So why did I say four? Uh, we're going to see. Um, wait, what is this? This is two, four, eight, 16. And if I now add each one there twice, I have 32. Not 128. OK, maybe I knew something more when I did this, but I don't know right now. We're going to see. Yeah, and then um, it said, as well as the between subjects vector task order, left equals green first or left equals red first. So what we're doing here after we added all the trials, all the blocks, so we can just look at it, uh, at this in the debugger, and we're going to see how many there are in the end, right? So let's don't care for this now. And we add the between subjects vectors that of the task order. And uh, depending on this, once we started our experiment, we can simply swap blocks. Yeah? So this is a really nice thing. And another nice way to show of how to incorporate the between subjects vector. So for few of them, the blocks are in the original order. And for a few of them, the blocks are simply switched. Good. For logging, we have to have the variable names. And this is mapping, color, position, which button was pressed, and the response time. And then we can simply save our design as Simon design. And then when we're actually presenting it, after um, we swapped our blocks or not, we simply, well, first of all, we show the instructions. Normally, you would have longer instructions and maybe a welcome message or something. But here, we simply have this left for green or left for wet. And then uh, we wait until our subject accepted these instructions and read them. And then we go through, ah, yeah, wait, for, we do this for all blocks. Like, we would have a welcome message before here, but we don't need it. And then we go through the blocks, present the fixed clause. Uh, wait for precisely 100, uh, 1,000 milliseconds. This is what they waited, what they said here. Oh, no. Succession calls for 500 milliseconds. So I did this wrong here. Uh, so we're only waiting for 500 milliseconds. I must read it myself. So we're waiting for 500 milliseconds. And in the meantime, while we're waiting, um, we are preloading our stimulus such that the presentation time then takes almost no time. And then we wait for a keyboard press where we're only allowing left and right keys. This is why we saved this response keys here. So for the keyboard press, we're only allowing left and right key. And then we add all the stuff we now have to our um, data folder. So the mapping, the, which is a factor of the block, the condition, uh, the color, which is a factor of the trial itself. The position is also of the trial itself. And then which button was pressed and the response time. And then once we looped over all this, um, we say uh, we give a goodbye text. This works in experiment also really easy. And we save our design too. OK, let's execute this. Uh, that was expected. What happened? Oh, sorry, that. This one's not supposed to occur. Text is zero with. Okay, whatever this means, I don't know myself right now, but we can simply. Don't I have the assignment task somewhere here too? If I don't, it doesn't matter.
Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like I said, split between those two screens. That was stupid. Yes, I want to quit the experiment. So this happens uh, if you do this on two screens. Spiderman is not really made uh, to work on two screens, but you can simply set the develop mode like we did before. Oh, oh sorry, two threads anyway. So, so this dual setup will be needed again. So now we don't have the between factor, um, between subjects factor. So we're always starting with left equals red, or with something random. I don't know myself right now. So now it waits uh, uh, left for red. So I press white, I press white, I press left, and so on and so on and so on. So let's quit this. Let's look. Well, rather, let's not go into the develop mode, but instead, let's use the windowed mode. Where's the window? Um, so it's executed. Now it will ask me. Do we have to set this now? That's always in the debug, right? Oh. Oh God! What do we see here? Aha! I did this wrong. I uh, shouldn't do this. No, I should do this right here. Ah, okay. Never mind that. That was correct. So first of all, we have the focus on the experiment, so that I can enter my subject number. Now the focus, after I said I'm ready, is again on the debugger. And I see an opening on my debugger. Um, first of all, what is this? It. Ah, shit. So the task order for my number three is left equals green first. Um, and let's look at everything here. So I don't know, do we need to swap blocks for this? Uh, we don't. So if I had another number, I would need to swap blocks. And now let's look here. I have two blocks. I have eight trials per block. So I don't have 128 here, and I probably only add, added two copies because I want to make it short. So it was not without reason called Simon experiment short. But yeah. So let's just not care for the debugger anymore. So this is, oh, I know that. So that's only eight ones per trial, yeah. So it's not showing every trial precisely once. Goodbye message, and we're done. Let's look into Jupyter again, because we're exporting. Um, Okay, let's look at the design because we saved the design. And what do we see? Oh, not again. No. To be precise with my scrolling wheel here. That's really annoying. I shouldn't have private stuff open when I'm having the lecture here. Okay, so we see block zero and block one are in this case not swapped. Uh, rather, no, we're only showing the design. Sorry, never mind. We're showing the design. So in our design, we simply have block zero as first and block one as second. Block zero is left equal screen, and then we have shuffled here um, the conditions. So we have white, red, 
twice, we have white green twice, and we have everything twice. And in the second block, we have everything twice again. So this is the design we saved. And now if we're looking at, yes, because I didn't start it from the launcher, but it was named Simon Task. Oh, no, actually, uh, I, I did it as this. Um, and in PyCharm, you can make these scratch files, but the scratch files are not stored in the same directory, but in this scratches file. So now it's actually saved here. Um, so, but I did it once before, so let me just look at the one where it says Simon task short here. Simon task. Oh no, it's not, what is it named? Yeah, it contains the name of the file as well as a subject ID. So I did this one for subject ID once. I did this once for subject ID one. And we see here, so it also tells the between subject factors. So the order of mapping here is one, two. So we're starting with left for wet, and then we have left for green, blah, blah, blah. And the events file is even much longer. The events file contains also no, I just don't have it here, but ah, I have 04. For whatever reason, there's this 04 here. Uh, and yeah, much longer, and I eventually interrupted it because no clue why. So it actually even gives me the error, the traceback. I didn't know that. That's really nice. But yeah, normally there shouldn't be an error in there, and if we executed it, uh, the correct way without any errors, there wouldn't be any error in there. Okay, um, that's basically it. So if you want to learn something about PsychoPy, I've added that first address for experiment is always their website. They also have this one paper um, where I copied some of their uh, resources from. So you see this here too. Um, always have to look at the docs. And a nice starting point if you want to make your own experiment is the stash because they have this website where they provide a few. I think I stole the Simon task. No, not the Simon. I stole one or two few, one or two tasks from there anyway. So this is just if you have something you want to create yourself, look at the experiment stash and at similar experiments that are already on the stash so that you only need to change it and you don't have to start from scratch. You can of course also start with these stuff here from scratch uh, uh, to copy your stuff. Like I said, uh, I think I also copied this one from this stage eventually. All right. Um, then, because I only have five minutes. So this here is the appendix shuffling. So uh, this is just something about shuffling with conditions. So this is if, you, if you're shuffling with conditions and you simply say, well, I simply reshuffle something. So imagine. Nah, let me show you the homework first. Sorry that I don't always this jumpy in this stuff, but the homework is more important. If you want to look at this, you can look at it at home. Oh, this is really something that's not the sample solution. Okay, um, so in this homework, you're supposed to make a task yourself, and this is the Sternberg item recognition task. So um, the Sternberg item recognition task tests if our short-term memory is, like when we look up stuff we, sh we stored in our short-term memory, um, we want to know if it's serial, serial or parallel, and if it's serial, if it's exhaustive or not. So imagine I am trying to remember 10 numbers, and then if my working memory worked in parallel, no matter in which order I memorized the numbers, I could access each one with the same response time. Okay? So all stored items could be recalled simultaneously, so with the same response time. Okay, if I'm storing serials, so in, in, in serials, so I only remember like, okay, first two, then seven, then five, then six, then to get the six, I would need a longer time than to get the two, right? Because I'm, okay, what were the numbers I stored? Two, no, I'm not looking for two. Two, seven, five, six, ah, six, okay, and then, okay, then I would be able to. 
Um, but if it's serial, there are also two different conditions because there are safe terminating and exhaustive search. So if I'm remembering the sequence two seven, oh, I always forgot it. Like, let's say the sequence was two seven four six, okay, and then if I'm looking for the seven and my recall was self-terminating, then it would be like two, seven, yes, seven, and that would be done. But the recall could also be exhaustive. Like if I'm looking for the seven, I still have to replay every item in my short-term memory, even though I found nobody. So two, seven, ah, seven, four, six, ah, okay, seven was in there. So it would be two, seven, four, six, I would go through the entire sequence, and then no. Okay, these are three different conditions, either parallel, or serial self-terminating, or serial exhaustive. Okay, and the Steinberg task tries to check which of these three possibilities hold by using this experimental setup. So we present one to six numbers between one and nine, one after another in a random order. Afterwards, we present a single number with two seconds of writing time, and then we have to tell if the single number was part of the sequence from before or not. And now, the hypotheses are, if the recall process was parallel, there would be no increase or a jumpy increase in response time, so um, jumpy increase simply means like if I have more numbers, uh, then it's harder anyway, um, but I don't have a linear increase um, from which, like uh, if it was the first, the second, the, fir the third, or so on number, okay? If the recall process was, process was serial and self-terminating, the response time would increase with every item until the item is actually found, if it was found, okay? so. We are asking for a random number of the sequence, so on average, um, if I present six numbers, so on average, like it will be found as the second element, but uh, the single number is not shown always. So if it was self uh, serial and self-terminating, like the response time would increase, um, but with a decreasing slope because I only need to look at all of the items um, when the number was actually there, and that then in, on average leads to a decreasing slope. Read the task description, it's, it's, it makes sense. <laughs> or just look the Sternberg task up on, up on Wikipedia. And if the recall process was zero and exhaustive, the response time would simply linear, linearly increase with every item. So if I have seven items, then it would take no matter which element of this, uh, like no matter if it was the first, the second, the third, or it didn't even occur there, the response time would simply linearly increase with the amount of items. Okay, so these are the possibilities. This is the hypothesis of the Sternberg task. I didn't explain them too well, I think, but like I said, look it up on Wikipedia. With this again, it makes sense. <laughs> so we're recreating Sternberg's task using experiment. And then this is just some, this is, it has 132 trials, but the first 12 are practice trials, and then two blocks of cyclic trials each, blah, blah, blah. And you're supposed to make this. Um, you're only supposed to make the experiment design because it's really a pain to test um, GUIs, as we've seen already for the Matplotlib exercise. And we, we don't test this. We're only testing the design. So you're supposed to make this design. There's a detailed description of how you do this. So you simply make an experiment dot block. Uh, so we simply make a block. You make trials in this block. Uh, it has factors. It doesn't even have in. It doesn't even have between subject factors. And then you simply save your design to CSV, and the test file only tests this design. Okay. So this here is um, the thing. So this has already a nice font. Blah blah blah. I already provided the instruction text, the, all the text. Blah blah. So you are only supposed to make this function make design. The function conduct experiment where we're looping through all the blocks, or rather we first show the instructions, blah, 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 uh, and then we're looping over all the blocks, present the stimulus, uh, the blank screen, and then the stimulus, and so on, and save this as data. I provided for you already. Um, you're only supposed to make the design. So, um, yeah, make design. Simply, you have, like, you get this argument, this exp, which is an uh, experiment.design.experiment, .experiment. And you have to add the blocks and add the trials to this. And then, yeah, this will create, because we are uh, saving the design somewhere below, uh, save design under Sternberg task design. And this is simply, this CSV will be tested by the test file. Um, 
or if it's the right way. The instructions are quite detailed. I think this should work rather well. All right, then that would be it. Thank you.